While most would argue that money does not buy happiness, not having the money desired can bring many negative feelings. Whether you are working at a job you hate because it pays well, or you feel like you're drowning in student debt, or wish you had the money to travel the world or live in the home of your dreams, money plays a major role in our lives. Regardless of your financial situation, many desire to achieve financial freedom and increase their financial security. But what if achieving financial freedom was easier than you thought? What if small changes in your lifestyle could lead to increased opportunities? Everybody and welcome to the Abundantly Minimal Podcast. That was Sarah. I'm Jake. And our goal is to help you take steps toward creating abundance by living intentionally. Today is episode seven, Spend or Save Like a Minimalist. We will be attempting to tackle some of the following topics, including why you should shift your financial habits to be more minimalistic, deciding between needs and wants, voting with your dollars, and how much should you spend, how much should you save, as well as real-life examples of spending and saving like a minimalist. Based on our own experience. Yes. Keep in mind, this is all our own experience. It's not like we have all the answers to everything. If we did, that would be awesome. We'd be really rich. Yes. But... You heard it here. (laughs) What I think is, just to start, what I think is so exciting about minimalism, especially when we look at the financial side of things, is that, especially when you're early in your life, if you can make, take some of these minimalist spending practices and apply them to your life, you can save thousands upon thousands of dollars in your life. And that has so many positive applica- or positive effects for you. So I would say this is so important for our young people today, especially the sooner you can start implementing minimalist spending practices, you can avoid so many future problems like debt down, down the road. Yeah. So let's talk about debt and why you should be uh, listening to this whole thing in the first place. So according to the 2016... Uh, American Household Credit Card Debt Study that was done by NerdWallet, the average American household, including mortgages, has $134,643 of debt. Credit card debt alone is about $16,748. So there is a lot that goes into debt these days. And As far as why debt has grown, something kind of outside of our own control, is the rise in the cost of living has outpaced income growth over the past 13 years. Median household income has grown 28% since 2003, but expenses have outpaced it significantly. Medical costs have increased by 57%, and food and beverage prices by 36% in that span. So yeah, besides, you know, just our own choices here, there's a lot that's going on, a lot that's been changing in the last 10, 15 years that really impacts how people can get into debt without even necessarily trying to get into debt. Absolutely. And today with what we're going to be talking about, we can't really, the two of us don't really have a lot of control about some of those factors about how much certain goods cost, but we are trying to target or pinpoint the areas of life where we do have the power to make a positive change. So outside of some of these larger issues, there is still a lot that we can do, especially when we're thinking from the minimalist perspective. Okay. Well, regardless, looking at all of those statistics there, I think the bottom line is that when we lower our costs, we can reduce the amount of stress caused by money possibly work less, and ultimately enable us to save more for the future and create financial freedom. Well, both of us have been really privileged so far in our lives and haven't actually found ourselves in debt at this point. There's still time. All right, stop that. Um, (laughs) But while we've been really privileged and not personally experienced um, debt, I know that many peers um, and even, you know, family or extended family members have 
had experiences uh, with debt. And in general, those experiences do tend to be negative and create a lot of undesired stress. When we are trying to talk about specifics here, as far as what we can do, I think the ultimate first question we need to ask is, how do we decide between our needs and our wants? Because this is pretty tricky. Now, on the, v- on the very surface level, you could say, well, okay, what do you need to survive? Food, water, shelter, a little bit of clothing. I mean, there's a very small list of things that would be considered actually like a need um, compared to wants. But it gets a little tricky because some people might say, well, I need my computer. I'd probably be guilty of that. I'm on my computer way too much and do it for, use it for work and my other jobs and <laughs> whatnot. So, I mean, or some people would say their phone is something they need. Oh, There's sorry. Okay. <laughs> to hear Jake's thoughts on, <laughs> on the phone thing, episode. <laughs> see episode six. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, as far as sign a need and want, this is also something that's very geographical, geographically based. And for example, we're both living in the U.S. right now. In the U.S., what is considered a need or want is very different than someone who is living in another country. And in general, I mean, the U.S. is a country where there is, does seem to be, you know, quote unquote, higher standard of living. Um, there is increased things that maybe people feel like they need, but you then look at the rest of the world and over half the world does not have access to those things. So it's a very, it's a very challenging question that. And I feel like there's a couple ways to that. And maybe Jake will want to chime in about some of these. I think looking at daily utility is really important. So for me, if I'm trying to decide whether something's a need or a want, I think about how much of its life, like my life or the life of this object, am I using it? So for something like a bed, <laughs> I, I swear I've, I've brought up beds and bedding <laughs> like just half these episodes. Every episode. There, there will be a YouTube video coming at some point where I'm just focusing on this, but you look at your bed, you're spending at least a fourth or a third of your life in that bed. So you better, I mean, if you're going to be spending some money, (laughs) you want to put the best, like you want to put more money in your bed situation because that's a fourth of your life. Now, if I pick a random item, let's just say a calculator. I just looked around the room and I saw a calculator. How much, what percentage of your life are you using that calculator? Now, I'm not saying a calculator is not important. I definitely appreciate a good calculator here and there. (laughs) <laughs> I don't know <laughs> <laughs> See, yeah better than if it do- doesn't work yeah um but uh, you know personally in my life i don't really need to use a ca- grab a calculator very often i think to be honest i just use the one on the computer sometimes if i actually like really need one but that's something that has such a low utility i'm probably not even using it one tenth of a percentage of my life now i mean back when i was in high school and in math classes, maybe I'd use it like a higher percentage, but still the utility of that item is so little. So whereas, you know, the bed is something that you're looking at 25 to 33% of your life of your day at all of that to this random object. So doing that question yourself, when you look at an item, figuring out, Maybe you'll even use a calculator to figure out the percentage. <laughs> yeah, you can't advise <laughs> them to get rid of that. But look at the items and see w- what is the utility on this. And I think sometimes we're like, oh, well, I can't get rid of that. How much do you actually use it? I think that's a really important question to ask. And then secondly, of course, um, we can't. D- I can't not talk about the emotional connection some of us have to certain items, but think about the meaning or joy that it b- gives your life or that it brings to your life, this particular item. So if it is something that is very useful to you or something that gives you joy, you know, that maybe you consider that a need. But if it's not one of those things, if it doesn't really bring you joy and if it's not really something you use a lot, then why do you have it? One final question to ask is how would removing this from my life affect me? And numerically, how much money would you save? So especially if there's people who have subscription services to different things, I think that's a great first step. Are you actually getting enough value out of that to make it worth it? 
one thing that I'll question, we do currently have a gym membership, and that's something I'm kind of question all the time. Is it worth the $50 a month? And that's kind of a discussion that we have and decide, okay, what's the offset? Like, what's the costs of doing this? What are the benefits? And so far, we've still kept it. But definitely, it's kind of a constant evaluation of is this service or is this aspect of my life needed? So can we go back to the bed for a second? (laughs) Always. (laughs) So when you said you better... Upgrade that better. Ha, 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 ha. Pun. I've been wanting to say that for like the last five minutes. <laughs> Secondly, uh, going back to your, I guess you not really going back to you just talked about this, but the uh, subscriptions thing. I guess I was interpreting it more so like um, instead of like a gym membership, which is also true what you mentioned, but like magazines, for example. Um, don't ask why, but when I was in high school. Uh, a friend of mine and I, we would sometimes go to like one of the public libraries around here and we would uh, be like just sitting in like the magazine section. And of course, we were just silly, I guess, kids, high school kids. So one of the magazines we'd always like jokingly, but not really, we kind of looked at it was like 17 magazines. <laughs> <laughs> Don't ask why. <laughs> the Cosmopolitan made it in there too. What? Sports Illustrated might have too. We, we were diverse in our viewpoints. Oh my God. But anyway, my point is, is that if you cut out the magazine subscription let's say like that's like your subscription that you're talking about there are other resources out there like your public library where you can go and i'm pretty sure you can probably check those magazines out like when they come out maybe it's not going to be 17 magazine again i don't know why we looked at that but or why you're sharing this with well, our my 102 po- listeners my point is is that their resources are there available to you that you don't have to like keep having them come to your house and clutter up your house and uh bother you i guess and waste your space after you're done looking at them so just kind of a point there and you don't have to pay i guess that was my big point you don't have to pay for them a way to cut down on your expenses and back to the daily utility thing i'm going full circle crazy here um for those who know me they know that i'm definitely not a math person so when sarah is reading off all these percentages for those of you who that works for that's awesome but if you are a um less mathematically minded person like myself I don't really look at the percentages of like, you know, how much percentage of a time that I use an item, but just basically do I use it daily? If I use it daily, even at some point, like I will say a calculator for me, since we were using that example, I use that pretty much daily because as a teacher, I don't like doing all the math in my head. I'm not a math teacher. I'm a history teacher. So I need to use that to go ahead and help me calculate my grades. No, I'm not on the calculator for like an hour or anything, (laughs) although it feels like it sometimes, but it definitely plays a role. So I'm not going to get rid of it in my case, just because I only use it for like one, one thousandth of my day or like whatever it is. It plays a role. If it's something that doesn't like say, like an article of clothing that you don't really wear often because I guess if you don't like it, you should just get rid of it. But, um, if it's like you're buying, I guess like clothing, if you're buying something that say you can only wear like a certain time of the year for whatever reason, and I know there's like different like summer and winter seasons, but maybe it's like a like a holiday type item, perhaps. We'll just use Easter as an example since Easter is uh, happening the day that we're recording this and uh, you don't want to wear that tie with Easter eggs on it for the rest of the year. Maybe that's just not something to be investing your money in. If you're buying something that you can only use for like a limited amount of time each year and you're not comfortable using it at other times in the year, then maybe avoiding getting yourself into debt or avoiding expenses for those types of items could be helpful. Absolutely. And one other thought too, just looking at um, kind of the subscription thing, I think with entertainment is a great place to question. And I think it also goes beyond just the question of like, you know, what's the utility? Because maybe let's say you've got a fancy TV package and maybe that does bring you a lot of joy. I think you also have to look at the cons of if you to continue spending your money in that way rather than uh, putting it elsewhere. Like is, let's say, I mean, and to be honest, we only spend about $5 a month on TV. So, and we just do basic channels. So I don't really know what it's like to spend a ton of money on TV channels. I assume 
do you, Jake, do you know how much it is? Like, is it like a fifty, uh, like a hundred dollars a well, month? It depends on the package that you let's, get. Let's uh, let's say you're going all out. Would you well, spend like a hundred? That's like what me and my roommates in college. That was. Oh yeah, and you guys spent a lot of it's money. It's like two hundred something, not Woo. per person, but total. So let's say so you're spending two hundred dollars to get like this epic TV package. So. With that, well, the TV watching is something that you value and maybe brings joy in your life. If you're struggling financially or wish to shift your financial habits, is it more worthwhile that you maybe do a downgraded version of your TV and then put that money aside? Like, even if you say you're going at a $200 package and you break it down to like a $50 package. I don't, again, I, I have no concept of what TV packages cost because I don't really care. But, <laughs> <laughs> well... You're a I, great person for advice <laughs> on this then, for the TV lovers out there. Well, but I'm just saying, so like, let's say you drop it down from 200 to 50 That's $150 that you have freed up. And when you do that over the course of the year, we're looking at almost $2,000 of savings just from downgrading your channels a bit. So when you think about the debt that you have or the other challenges you're having to make ends meet, that could be something to think about. And so when we're deciding between these needs and wants, yes, it's really tough. And yes, everyone maybe has their different hobbies or activities that do cost more. But is it ultimately worth causing yourself future challenges, stress, negativity, I don't know. That's that's ultimately what you have to ask yourself. So kind of just going off of what Sarah said, I mean, voting with your dollar, the idea of, first of all, like spending your money on, I guess, activities, hobbies and whatnot that actually are rewarding to you and actually bring value to your life. That is important. But I mean, just thinking about like we all have to consume, we all have to go ahead and spend money to live. That's kind of inevitable unless you like deal in monopoly money or something. <laughs> but even then, I still argue it's real. But you, we all have to spend money. And so it's not that it's bad to spend money, as I mean, I think just about any minimalist will tell you. You just want to make sure that when you're doing it, at least for us, we really think about what we are doing as far as spending. I mean, I don't know, even not with just with money, but like I've like adopted this mindset with like just kind of life now, even making simple decisions. And so sometimes people laugh at me because of it because it takes so long to make like simple decisions, like maybe making breakfast, what I might eat or something. But when it comes to actually your money, it's good to do because if you're going to spend it, you want to make sure that you're actually spending it on something that is going to be important and something that's going to bring value. Otherwise, you're just kind of throwing money down the drain and risking whether or not you're going to like it or not. And so something that Sarah and I have recently been into is something that costs a little bit of money. We've been buying, like, going back to the bed, <laughs> organic, like, bedding. <laughs> it whatnot. always comes back organic, to the uh, Organic cotton bedding or, like, some uh, recent clothing purchases that we've both made, which organic stuff is just by nature, since it's organic and it's raised – more or created more ethically with like the least harm to the environment to the people that are manufacturing and creating it it's going to cost more money for the consumer to actually go ahead and buy it and to some people they might be like well sarah and jake that's kind of crazy like you're talking about being minimalist but here you are spending more money than you actually need to to buy this stuff but if someone not that anyone's ever asked me this i guess but if someone was to ask me why do you do this my answer would simply be because it's something that I value. It's something that I think is important, in this case, the ethics of it. And so I'm willing to go ahead and spend money on something that is of higher quality that in the long run is going to last me a longer time, whereas possibly somebody else gets something like, uh, say, a sweatshirt. Since I'm wearing a newer sweatshirt I just got, they might have to go and replace that sweatshirt or you know, item X, whatever you want to throw in there, quicker than I will because maybe the quality of it was not as great and so they end up spending that money i mean over a longer period of time but we end up spending probably a similar amount anyway if not maybe they end up spending a little bit more so my whole thing is if it brings you value you can obviously you can afford it and you are planning on using it like if i just bought this shirt and like never wore it or like just wore it once in a while well that would probably not be a good purchase but i mean i just got this thing i've worn it like a bunch already so i mean 
you have to make those like decisions for yourself. But I mean, just thinking about, again, is this something that's going to bring you immense value? Is this something that's going to be high quality that's going to last a while? If it is, splurge for it, go for it. As long as you're, and like our case, we cut back on other things. Like we don't really, I guess, eat, um, not that we don't eat, we eat everything. <laughs> you kind of have to We've eat. We've saved a lot of money <laughs> by not eating anymore. No, by not uh, eating at restaurants, I guess, as much. Or like we don't, um, I guess the TV bill, like you mentioned, we don't really pay for that. So cut costs in other areas, and then you can really splurge more so on areas that you really find valuable. Yeah, and I'm sure if there were, not that we have that many listeners, but you know, there could be some minimalist haters out there being like, oh, you guys are buying stuff? Like, how is that minimalist? Dude, but we have haters right now? <laughs> no, I don't like, think that's do. awesome. <laughs> Like, we're doing pretty well, or we really <laughs> suck. I don't know. One of the Jake two. wants to know. Leave us a comment. Are you a hater? <laughs> You're a hater. <laughs> Hater's going to hate. <laughs> but thank you. We appreciate that you're still yes. hating and listening. Give us those views. But you, but you, uh, you don't have to. It's okay. You can As with the voting with your dollar concept, I mean, this doesn't just have to apply with minimalism. This can apply to anything. What is really great about the voting with your dollar concept is that it really meshes well with minimalism. And it definitely has to do with the ethics and values, as Jake talked about, and really wanting to support companies or products when you are shopping that do reflect the values that you have. You know, someone could say, well, Sarah and Jake, I want to support more ethical products, but I just can't afford it. And I get it. You know, that's t- typically these ethical products can be more expensive, um, at least in terms of the cost that we pay. But the beauty of minimalism is that since you are buying less, you can buy better and still have more financial resources available to you. It's kind of the concept, this is related on the True Cost documentary uh, that's specifically about fashion, but looking at for many people, people are used to buying their clothing in these big box stores or just, you know, your generic type stores. And I used to, that's where I used to get some clothing like growing up. But you might buy like, because the clothing's cheaper, you might buy 10 things and maybe you use those 10 things a lot. The shocking statistic that is revealed in True Cost is that within six months, 99% of the stuff that is purchased is thrown away. So that's as a whole. Maybe you're someone who doesn't throw away your items or donate them or get rid of them as much. Unfortunately, the truth is about donating your clothes is that much of that ultimately ends up in the landfill as well. So say 99%. Yeah, 99%. And that's not just clothing, but 99% of stuff that's purchased within six months will be in a landfill. That was wow. shared in the True Cost documentary. It's pretty crazy. I never, I didn't realize. I mean, but we're some, we're people who don't really generate that much trash. Like we'll go weeks without taking a bag out to the curb. Like we don't really <laughs> generate. We just keep it all inside the house. <laughs> no, we don't. Just really. Bathe in it. Our, okay, <laughs> we're, this is too going much on. information. <laughs> no, none of that is true. So anyway, you're able to buy better because you're buying less. So rather than buying 10 things that are lower quality and, you know, more basic like that, you can get something that's a little bit nicer and again, aligning it to the ethics. So for me, I know this is something I really value, especially over the last couple of years as I've become a more informed consumer. I've seen that with pretty much any purchase, I can either help the environment help the people who are making the goods or like in the case, especially with eating, I can prevent cruelty uh, to like animals and all those things are very intertwined in a lot of things. And so for me, then it, you know, even though certain conveniences maybe have to be shifted around or it makes it a little bit more complicated, online shopping has really helped for in terms of some things, but the idea that everything I do buy going forward is a lot more ethical the story of stuff, if you haven't ever heard of that before, it's, it's really cool. It's, it's a little bit dated now, but I think the message is still very relevant. But the idea of thinking about the big picture of all of our stuff, and a lot of times we're kind of stuck in the consumer mindset. When I go to the store, it's got a price tag. I pay that much money and I get the item. But we're not thinking about, and it mentions it in Story of Stuff, is the hidden costs. And so you're looking at the cost of labor. How is that person treated? 
what are the health implications of them interacting with the items that kind of go into this? What are the environmental consequences of how these materials are put together? And <laughs> the sad truth is, especially for American consumers, probably like so much stuff, the vast majority of these unethical or of these, you know, standard products have terrible ethics behind them. And I feel like any person who's got a heart, like it breaks your heart when you see what the actual situation is. And I know for me, again, like obviously we've got a lot of privilege. We're not in debt. We have started following this minimalist lifestyle and saved a lot of money from it. We're saving this money so we can spend more. But it's just like, I know I don't want to inflict harm on another being. And so if I can make a more ethical choice and prevent that from happening, like I'm all in. And so, you know, even something as simple as like you're talking about your, you know, organic clothing. I know for you, one of the big factors is health benefits because the more organic that we're eating or wearing can really impact our health and prevent certain types of cancer and other related things down the long term. I'm not going to give any specific statistics today. There's those benefits, but then also just thinking of the people who are growing the cotton and people who are involved in the manufacturing who then, because this business that has organic products, they're, you're supporting you're supporting workers and farmers who don't have to use those pesticides and risk their lives. Going back to the True Cost documentary, one of the really tragic examples is that a woman, and I, I don't remember the name, unfortunately. I saw it about a year ago. But she was in Texas, and in Texas there's a really large um, you know, production of cotton or cotton farms down there. And what's also really interesting, cotton's very pesticide-heavy. And within this small area, within one town, they had 14 cancer treatment centers because these people who had been farming this pesticide-ridden cotton their whole lives – pretty much all of them were getting these cancers. The fact that in one town you've got 14 cancer centers, that's a red flag. So it's like, again, and I'm not going to tell you what to believe in and what choice you have to make. I'm just saying for myself, it all comes back to the ethics. And I want to, if I'm spending money out there, it better be going for something that I care, like that's going to ultimately lead to less suffering. And again, that's where minimalism comes in because Yes, these products are more expensive, but if you're buying less, then it shouldn't really be an issue because what we've still found is that buying less stuff allows us to make some of these purchases here and there, and it's still cheaper than what we would be doing. That was kind of a long uh, rant. I think you said <laughs> everything that needed to be said there. You did a good job. I'm very passionate about this topic, if you guys tell, yeah. couldn't tell. So get into, I guess, our second to last so. Yeah, we're we're moving despite my lawn tangent there. How much should you spend? How much should you save? I mean, I guess there's really no way to like tell you how exactly how much you should spend, how much you should save because for everybody different incomes, different life situation, not well, going to be different. But just in general, I mean, the whole idea of trying to go ahead and make sure that you I mean, this sounds really simple and really cliche, but truly, like, save more than you actually spend because, I mean, the other way around, that's exactly how debt's going to happen. And kind of going back to that idea that, I mean, for me that I've taken to heart is that, like, really any sort of debt to me I feel like is is bad debt. If I can't pay for something, like, immediately, and like Sarah said, we, we are pretty lucky with the situation that we're in. But I know that if I ever came into a situation where something comes on the table that I can't pay for at the time, then, I mean, I'm not I'm not going to buy it. Now, I guess the only, like, exceptions to that is, like, you know, down payments for a house or paying that. We'll in probably some sort not of, be able to fully pay for our house. Right. But we're saving up for it. They'll go. <laughs> but, like, I mean, in terms of, I guess, I mean, a house would fall under something that, you know, shelter, something that you that you uh, need to have, but just if there's other sorts of activities or items out there that are going to put me into debt, like I'm not going to go spend, I don't even know how much it would cost for like a, like a pool, like an in-ground pool or something in the backyard that I don't have right now or that we don't have. I don't think our landlord would be too happy if we uh, put a pool back there. But in any case, 
I'm just truly thinking about trying to spend as little as possible that you're going to spend, make it on something that counts, make it on something that's important, and then just save it, setting aside money to save like as much as you can. I think that we kind of have taken this a little bit to the extreme. I mean, with all the different sorts of like places that we're like saving money and putting money, some that can be accessed you know, when we need it, others that you know stuff's not going to get accessed until well later in our lives with like retirement and whatnot. I mean, we've already established like several different avenues of of savings. So that way, you know, we have plenty that we need right now. We have what we can, you know, access if we need it. And then we've got stuff, you know, stored away so that, you know, even if for some reason this wouldn't happen to Sarah, but if I just lost my mind and went on like a spending spree, there's a bunch of like that I can't touch because it's like all safe and secured and, and it's not going anywhere for the next however many years. So just... um. I guess like establishing that kind of that kind of stuff early, I think has been has been pretty good because like already I feel like in just these first few years of being ma- married and having jobs, we've seen some some nice uh, accumulation and gains because we're not spending everything that we make. Absolutely, and I think too. I mean, it's it is really tempting to spend. I mean, I I think we all have different areas of life where it's tougher for us and we want to keep buying. And so I'm not going to pretend that it's not easy. I mean, I think it's a kind of a skill or a habit. So like for me, even if there were certain areas where I'd be more tempted to spend before, I feel like I have, you know, restricted that quite a bit. But I mean, I know that there's different challenges that people face with regarding spending, but I think despite these challenges, one thing that can be really helpful for us is to think about why you want to save. And personally, and this has kind of been my my frame of reference for a long time, I really kind of come up with four causes or reasons for saving that affect me. And I mean, I think also mutually affect Jake. These are not in any particular order. I guess kind of, they're all kind of mixed together, but Things that I care about right now, saving up for the house, obviously, like buying a house. We've just been uh, renting, and I don't know. Obviously, a lot of people go into major debt when their house is. I really want to try to minimize that debt as much as possible. Uh, I know with housing costs, one of the greatest ways that you can apply minimalism as well as save money is to get a smaller space. It's tough because... (laughs) I'm just amazed. Not that we've actually seriously looked at a house anywhere, but every time you see these subdivisions pop up, they are massive houses. And I'm just thinking like, is there anyone who doesn't want a massive house? Like I feel like none of these houses that are going up are going to be things that I'll ever want because they're ginormous. You know, we even want a decently large family going forward. Um, I mean, ideally, but (laughs) I just, I I can't get behind that like a giant house. Um, So I'm going, saving up for house, uh, saving up for kids for sure. I know that we, they're not yet in the picture for us, but within a few years they will be. And I know that there's a lot of cost for that as well as just thinking about long-term. We've been very lucky. Our parents were really supportive. Both of our sets of our parents were very supportive of us financially. So I, I mean, especially with college payments, um, providing what we needed in childhood. So again, really appreciative of that. We want to do the same for our kids. Obviously, who knows what life will be like and what college will be like then. But the idea is that we want to set our kids up for success as well. Um, Not spoil them, of course, but setting them up for success. Travel. This is my biggest splurge. I know travel is not required. But I kind of part of the reason that motivates me to work as hard as I do is so I know that I can be saving enough money, that there's also enough money that I can save. So I'm not sacrificing from any of the other categories, but I'm still able to travel because that is one of my favorite things to do. And, of course, retirement and wanting to make sure, especially when you're young, to make these as large of a contribution as you're able because that's going to grow so much by the time you are retirement age. So when I think about these things, these are all so important to me more important, I would say, than any individual purchase if there's something I'm debating. Should I do this? Should I buy this? And to be honest, I don't think that there's anything that is more important than those four things, like thinking about why I would save. Obviously, Jake, you're really important to me. Thanks. (laughs) But (laughs) love is priceless. (laughs) And just in general, the more I spend on your more generic things, then the more money is left for these other categories. 
But I think it'd be most helpful if we give some real life examples of how we've spent and saved like a minimalist. Well, I guess just one example that comes to mind. Well, Sarah actually wrote it down. So, but um, back when we got married, like what, almost three years ago? Woop woop. It's kind of crazy. But I mean, I don't remember all of the ins and outs and details of it now, but just we made a point with our wedding. Like that's something that traditionally a lot of people spend like a great deal of money on. I mean, you hear, I feel Rough like it average is about $25,000. Yeah. So, I mean, I was going to say like five figures at least. So like, you know, in our case, especially, I mean, that would be like two thirds of like what we make like individually, like a year with like our, our salaries. Just making sure that we didn't lose sight of like what actually was important, what actually like for the wedding, like, is like valuable to us. I mean, we weren't by any means considering ourselves minimalist then, but even then we didn't need to like necessarily have, I mean, for us, like the, like the decor, for example, like the types of like our expenses of like the tablecloths or chairs or having like the best venue or having a DJ or any of that kind of stuff wasn't really something that was important to us per se. And so not feeling like we had to have everything because that's what all the other weddings had i mean for crying out loud like we didn't even try our dessert (laughs) that we had at that (laughs) wedding before we served it it. good it ended up being pretty awesome but like it was literally like a sheet cake it was free like just included in the whatever menu i mean you just trusted i mean it was gonna be good so it it, it did even if it wasn't who cares you know well, maybe all you know, the people who attended. But like, maybe, maybe when they leave the wedding, like, you know, oh man, are they going to grumble to their car? That cake was terrible. And then are they? I mean, that's that's it, right? Then they they don't care anymore. Life has more important things to think about than if cake was good. Let them eat cake, even bad cake. <laughs> that I guess small example. I have a terrible memory, so I can't talk about all like the the costs and everything. But I mean. What was it that we ended up spending total on that? We thing? spent about four thousand. Four thousand dollars. I mean, this this included for a hundred people. I mean, this included that includes everything. my dress. That includes wedding our, rings. Our two dollar wedding rings. I think one of the big things that helped us too is that we really didn't care. And I mean, again, the wedding, a girl's wedding, or, well, a couple's wedding. Thanks, girl's <laughs> wedding. A couple's wedding is very much, you know, whatever they want it to be, and we're not trying to take that away. But just, you know, from our own perspective, I mean, I'm not someone who cares about tradition sometimes. So, like, I'm not going to make my I'm not going to fork over, you know, that remaining twenty one thousand dollars that I didn't to try to make my wedding live up to someone else's expectations. Honestly, it was a beautiful day. It was such a fun day. And maybe they're a little biased, but my family still says like they thought it was perfect. And, you know was something that just was such a fun moment and we weren't you know we're not super fancy people i don't care at all about jewelry we got two dollar rings stainless steel from amazon love them so much i'm so happy i didn't spend five thousand dollars which the average is five thousand dollars for rings like engagement plus the wedding ring i'm so happy that saved you know four thousand nine hundred ninety six dollars for us to spend on other things um, I, my dress I ordered um, online for $100. It fit perfectly. I know that was lucky. But, I mean, I saved a lot of money there. Looking at, we had a lunchtime wedding, no alcohol. We kept things really basic. And again, other people, what I'm describing doesn't sound probably like what they want. But for us, the day we had was beautiful. And there was maybe a few extra, you know, things we had to do since we didn't hire someone to do them. But for $21,000 of savings, I'd say it was worth it. (laughs) For sure. For sure. Another thing that I think you can spend and also save for kind of like a minimalist uh, is travel. There's a lot of different travel styles that people have too. We have, you know, prioritized travel in our life. And so we have traveled quite a bit and, Like I've mentioned before tonight, I really love travel so much and always want to try to make it possible. As far as the style of travel, there's a lot of ways that people can travel that don't cost very much money and ways you can make things more affordable. So, I mean, we're not, you know, people who have to stay in five-star hotels and have things be really fancy. 
I personally really love Airbnb, and oftentimes that gives us a much more affordable option than a hotel. Some people feel a little uncomfortable about that. That's fine, but it's a way that we've saved a lot of money. I'm very supportive of pl- public transit. We did a big road trip this past summer, and I don't think we were you know, necessarily that fancy at any time, but you don't have to use money as an excuse not to travel, and there's a lot of really incredible ways that you can travel and things you can do that are free. So if you do have a destination in mind, obviously if you're looking to go overseas, I mean, you're going to have to pay for an airline ticket, <laughs> likely, or a boat, or I don't know. Airline ticket is probably cheaper, to be honest. But thinking about when you get to your destination, what you can do to cut costs. We've gone to grocery stores instead of going out to eat. We have like I said, use public transportation rather than using cabs and things that would be more expensive. We've done free walking tours in many cities. There are so many things that you can do that are free or for very minimal costs, and that works for us. I should let you talk about the clothing example because you are definitely in the midst I mean, of a clothing. I just did that one, didn't we? I guess what I would say for clothing, I know this doesn't really affect Jake as much, but I'm really into used clothing and also used shoes, which I guess maybe grosses some people out. I really, in general, (laughs) hate shopping so much if it's not for, like, food. Um, (laughs) But when I'm at Goodwill, (laughs) I am, like, a kid in, I guess, a candy store. Or any any used store. Any used store, yeah. I don't know. I just, I love it. I went there. I had a pair of shoes that died out. But I swear, like, I even feel like you know your basic cheap stores with really cheap conditions of things and all of that and poor conditions of things like i feel like are too expensive now because i'm just so used to buying goodwill stuff it's like i mean five dollars or less for something and then what's so great too just going back to my value voting with your dollars kind of a thing What's so great is that not only am I kind of removing it from potential landfill, but it's also I'm buying it used. So it's not like for my item that I'm getting, it's not like any new hazards or suffering was created. That item already existed. Someone else made that choice. But at least now I can prevent it from going to the landfill. And if it's something I can use, then I'm preventing any additional items. I guess the only thing that I'd add to the clothing, since I already kind of mentioned it earlier, I don't want to repeat too much, but... If you're like looking to buy some of like the eco brands that are a little bit more expensive, I mean something I found out is that I mean a lot of these like websites when you order online certain times of year they're gonna have sales. I mean just like actual like brick and mortar stores do. So waiting for like the sale or waiting for like items to be like out of I guess season in terms of like right now we're kind of transitioning from like winter to summer. So a lot of the uh, items that were being sold just a couple months ago now are going to be like on clearance so like this would be the time to go ahead and, and get those and i mean they're still the same quality and i mean styles don't really change too much so you're still going to be fine buying that stuff so just a couple like tricks and ways to go ahead and try to get around that if you are wanting to to i guess change over your wardrobe and i guess just something else too is like you don't have to go expending all this money at once like i know that we've been switching over like different sorts of clothes like over the last five months six months longer than that i guess so it's not like it has to be something overnight but just like when something like wears out like this belt that i had for a long time i made sure that the belt i was going to buy was going to be the one that like actually i felt good about ethically and whatnot cork belt was a little expensive i suppose for for a belt but I mean, it's it's durable. It's gotten the job done, and you feel good about it. So that's, I guess, all I would really add to, to that. And I guess one really obvious thing that I guess I'm missing that I haven't said yet, but also, like, evaluate what you have, but maybe just don't go shopping as much. Because if we shop, and we're even if you're online shopping, if you're looking at that stuff, you're more likely to buy things. If you just don't go, chances are... You know, if you're able, if you're listening to this podcast, maybe you are someone who honestly has plenty and doesn't really need anything. And again, it goes back to that needs and wants question. But I know we were kind of talking about the shift of more ethical, but just, and even if you're buying used, like just stop buying to, you know, it can be a way to try to use what you have, really evaluate what you have and how you feel when you're wearing it or what you're using it for. If there are duplicates of things that you don't need. 
And there is something powerful, and you can attest to it more than I can, but something powerful about having a much smaller wardrobe than what you maybe used to have. Certainly makes picking your outfit a lot easier. I mean, just to have, like, less choices. I mean, it's counterintuitive, but, like, I forgot where we heard this. But it's, like, basically the less choices that you have. I mean, as long as you have a choice, but the less choices that you have, you actually are more satisfied with the choice that you made because if you have, like two or three choices versus I think the example was like 25 choices. You're going to be wondering that, man, there's all these other opportunities that I, I missed out on by, you know, making the one choice that I did where if you only chose between like you know, three or four things, you can pretty confidently say, yeah, this is the, uh, the best option. I'm not really going to be missing out on some of this other stuff. So I think like Sarah said, reducing the items that you bring in, it's going to help out with your debt. And it's also going to help out with your expenses, obviously. And then it really helps you evaluate better what you have. So that way, when you do go purchase something, it's not just like a knee jerk reaction, but something that you like actually think about thought through with money, especially even something is like, I don't want to say simple, but something just like a T-shirt. I mean, when you take like that purchasing of that T-shirt very seriously, I mean, you're going to be in a good place because that means that you're really making like conscious and thoughtful decisions about everything you're buying. Absolutely. And even though, like we said at the beginning, we're pretty young overall, I still with many things wish I knew what I do now regarding what I actually need. Because for a while my thought process was different. I thought that, Oh, it's good if I can accumulate more stuff because I don't have to buy it later. It was kind of like the cheap part of me that was thinking that. But even still, some of those items that I got cheaply, I didn't actually need. And I bet, and I, I mean, since I'm since we're still pretty young, I'm guessing this number is not necessarily as much as many people would be. I bet honestly, like I could have saved like three to five thousand dollars. That over time don't really seem like that much, but I bet had I known that hey you know what you're never going to need that or really should you be buying that no you don't need that and even though I, we're again we're really young i mean we're looking at just a few years of you know making purchases completely as a a free adult here that that's big money i mean again thinking about my travel <laughs> travel desires that's a that's a whole bonus trip so it adds up and again if especially if you're young i so encourage you to develop these habits now because you know, you hear about examples online or on the news, or maybe you can think of some examples in your own life of people who have really struggled financially, but yet their lifestyle that they're trying to continue living doesn't reflect that. Like, they're, it almost seems like they're kind of trying to pretend that they're richer than they are while digging themselves in a bigger hole. These are harsh things to talk about, but it's a passion of mine that people are able to have the financial freedom to not be in those situations. And having less stuff is the easiest, one of the easiest ways to get there. We hope that some of these tips were helpful for you guys and that you'll be able to help apply to your own lives with uh, dealing with debt, dealing with expenses, dealing with money in general, uh, whatever the case may be. If you have been liking what you are hearing, you're not one of those haters out there that we were talking about earlier. Even if you are, please do this. Let us know your uh, your wrath anyway. But if you could leave us, you know, some sort of feedback on iTunes, YouTube, wherever it is that you are watching this, either like a subscription on YouTube, a review on iTunes or subscription on iTunes subscription on iTunes just some sort of communication we would greatly appreciate that as we're getting this started we're still newbies we're still infants in the world of podcasting just and it, it honestly makes such a huge difference um, with getting our podcast out to more listeners so please 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 if you can find it in you to give us a review or Say hello, whatever the case might be. Or, or let us know what we miss. What are methods that you use to try to save more money? Have you implemented any of these tips we're suggesting? Could we take things farther? Any of that feedback, we'd love to hear it. It's like we always say, we definitely don't know all the answers. We're just going off of our own experiences and it's the experiences of those that we, that we know. So if there's anything that you want to add on, we would love to hear it. 
But I think we've said what we need to say here today. Thank you guys so much for listening and have an awesome rest of your day, night, whenever. And we'll see you next time. Bye. Bye.